morning, everyone. Welcome to Critical Thinking Practical Reasoning, the Unit 6 discussion for the course UGIC 150. This will be our sixth week together. This is week six. So we would want you all to be minded as you prepare to complete your assignment and then also prepare to write your interim assessment work settlement in the AP. My name is Dr. Nancy Miles, staff for GP. The senior lecturer of the philosophy and classics department, University of Ghana School of Arts, College of Humanities, I also currently coordinates and examine UGRC 150. We will quickly do our unit six now. May I have one of you raise your hand if you can do as the honest to read for us. Very quickly, please, so that we don't spend too much time. Thanks, will give to go ahead. So I projected the outline. You can do that for us. We're going to be on standby. Thanks, will go ahead. Contrasting deductive and inductive arguments, particular and general statements, reference class and attributes class, types of generalizations, universal generalizations as disguised conditionals, Did, deductive arguments and inductive oh, arguments. Please, the slides. Okay, my lady, continue now. Four valid syllog syllogistic patterns, understanding mm. syllogisms, understanding negation, modus ponens, affirmation the antecedents, modus tonens, negating the consequence, disjunctive syllogism, hypothetical syllogism, formal fallacies, fallacy of affirming the conse consequence, Fallacy of negating the antecedent, false hypothetical syllogism, valid arguments and sound arguments. Wow, so, so much to cover. It looks okay until we start opening it out. Then you will see that it's, it's not so much after all, but you have to know all the intricacies. Okay, so we are going to take them one after the other. And I want to start with an understanding of the main distinction we can have between the two types of argument. When we did argument in unit three, you remember we contrasted types of discourse. So we saw instruction, narrative, polemical rhetoric, some would say rhetorical polemic, and then we saw argument. When we saw argument, we, we said that an argument is a set of statements, only one of which, is the conclusion, whilst all the rest are the premises leading to that conclusion. Okay, and so an argument is a collection of statements, not just one statement, at least two or more. Why? Because an argument has two parts. So keep looking at my screen. Let's recall that. The whole argument has two parts, premises, and what? A conclusion. Premises can also be, you can refer to premises as reasons or evidence that is offered, eh? offered to do what? As a response, as a grounds or, or justification for the conclusion you address. So you want to say something, you want to support what you want to say with evidence. What you want to say is a conclusion. And how you ground what you want to say is the premise. The reason why you say what you say is the premise. Now, whenever we have argument, then we are making a claim and supporting that claim with evidence. Then we said there are two types of argument. Better still, there are two ways of reasoning. You either argue deductively on your screen now. I'm teaching with the screen. So if you get distracted, you're only listening to me, it might not be helpful. So you have to look at the screen where you can. Respectfully, okay. My special students with visual impairment understand what we say when we say you. Okay. So, so please keep. Can anyone see the slides? So look on the screen. Yes, madam. Yes, 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 y
the lady read from the screen. Everyone keep quiet. Let's continue. Please keep quiet. So these terms describe two types of argument, deduction and induction. Okay. A deductive argument then is which one? Which type of argument will we call deduction? And which one will, will we call induction? When we deduce, a deduction simply means you have argued in such a way that if your premises were true, it will mean that the conclusion you are drawing will also necessarily be true. That is what makes an argument deductive. If the premises were true, it will mean that the conclusion must also be true necessarily. Else it creates a contradiction. So if I have a, a deductive argument, it simply means if my premises were true, it will mean the conclusion won't also necessarily be true. That is a valid deduction. Valid just means a correct deduction. You deduce the conclusion correctly. Sometimes people deduce, but the deduction is not done appropriately. So we, then it becomes a formal fallacy, a fallacy of the form. Because deductions or a reasoning that is deductive would have a pattern, a form, a structure that you have to follow. So if you do not follow it to do the deduction properly, then we would say it is what? A, 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 a fallacy of the form. You are erring against the form. You are making a mistake about the form. So formal fallacies are committed when you are doing deduction, deeper than you let, deduction, you don't do it well. You, you go contrary to the form, the pattern that you has prescribed for that form, okay? I just want you to get the difference between formal and informal fallacy now. So unit 10 will deal with informal fallacy, not formal fallacy. But here, when the sister read and thing, Priscilla, I think, read it, you had her read out, um, and then a paint, no, it wasn't pencil, I think it was pencil gifted. When she read it out, you had a read formal fallacies such, fallacy, 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 fallacy. oh, such as affirming the consequent, keep looking on your screen now, I'm going to project that, denying the antecedent, this is it. There we go, you see? They were in the outline. Things you have to know by the end of the unit six. The unit six will be done in two weeks. This is week one of the unit six. It's heavy. Check your course outlines, okay? So by the time we finish unit six, on your screen, you see the red ink fallacies. Formal fallacies means errors. Fallacy just means an error, a mistake in the way you are reasoning, okay? When you say that's fallacious, it means that there's an error. You are committing a mistake in the way you are reasoning. So when we err against the form, and we'll study four forms of the reasoning was deductive, the correct one. So for valid syllogistic pattern, what is the word syllogism? It just means where a type of argument that has two premises leading to what? A conclusion. That's what a syllogism is. A deductive argument that has what? Two premises and what? A single conclusion. So two steps, the premises are two, conclusion is one, the argument is deductive, that will be called a syllogism. So Madame kept saying hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive syllogism, modus tollens and modus ponens. All the four valid patterns you see on your screen already in the outline, <coughs> excuse me, are what? Valid deductive forms. Form meaning a pattern of reasoning that you must follow. Just like if you wanted to unlock your phone, you would swipe it in a certain way, the way you keyed in to, to lock it. Maybe you created a Z to lock the phone. Then if you want to unlock it, that is the pattern to follow. If you don't do that, you will go against the form. And so you will err, you commit a fallacy called a, a, a formal fallacy. Okay, one of such formal fallacies is what? A fallacy that affirms the consequence instead of affirming the antecedent. 
look up here, when we say modus ponens, we say that pattern is also called affirming the antecedent. It's a correct one, it's a valid one. So if someone wants to go and affirm, but doesn't affirm the antecedent, rather affirms the consequence, like you see on our screen, we will query that and say that the person is committing a formal fallacy, which type, the one that affirms the consequence. Take note of the name. Then modus tollens has another name, the one at the top, valid, that one is valid. It's the correct way of doing it. Negating the consequence is another name for what? Modus stolen. You see all those patterns sometimes before the, the, the unit ends. Okay, hopefully today, if not, then subsequently. This junctive syllogism is also valid. Now, if someone is trying to do modus stolen, the second one I project here, which is negating the consequence, but doesn't do that, rather goes to negate the antecedent person will create a formal fallacy. So see, they are twins. Or better still, an original and it's counterfeit. The correct version, modus ponens, that's what affirms the antecedent. The fallacy, pretending to be doing modus ponens, but does it wrongly, is what? The fallacy of affirming the consequence. You go and affirm the consequence instead of affirming the antecedent, you create a fallacy, and so on and so forth, okay? So back to this place, we are trying to explain to you deduction versus induction. We said where the argument is a deduction, it will mean that as soon as the premises are assumed to be true, taken to be true, it will affect the truth also of what the conclusion. If you accept the premises to be true at once by force, immediate and immediately, <laughs> the conclusion also becomes true. Why? Because in a valid deduction, the conclusion is already a part of the premise. And that is what should solve the thing for you. If the deduction was a valid one that you've done, you're arguing and you have argued deductively and you've done the deduction a valid way, what it will mean is that the conclusion you are drawing was already part of the premise, like the seed of an orange is already part of the food, orange food you took home. So you took my orange on my table. It means you have taken the seeds of the orange as well. So you accept the orange as true. You cannot reject the conclusion that came with it. It's like you and your shadow. Your shadow is your conclusion. You, the human being, are, are, the, are the, what, the premise. If I ask you into my room and you are coming or your shadow follows, you don't say, ah, I said you should come, not your shadow. Well, how will I come without my shadow? My shadow is already a part of me. Same, I use the baby and the mother scenario. Pregnant woman with baby inside the tummy. You have a pregnant woman in, the pregnant woman is a premise. Accept her as true into your room. You already accepted the conclusion with it. Envelope that has cash inside. I could go on and on and on. If you are interested in the envelope, ah, where is my envelope? Where is that? It's because of the conclusion. The cash is inside. You accept the envelope, you have already accepted the cash within it. Now, if someone tries to accept the premises as true, but does not want to accept the conclusion that comes with it, where we have a deductive argument, the person will create, look on my screen, please, respectfully, the person will create a contradiction. That's what is on your screen now in red. So my lady, please read this to help us get a distinction again for deduction versus induction. So far stressed on what deduction is. If the premises were true, it would require that a conclusion must also be true, else you create a contradiction. How about induction? Before Sister Reed, for an inductive argument, look at from the word induced, the false that. So for an inductive argument, it is possible for the premises to be accepted as true and yet the conclusion rejected as false and no contradiction will be created. Why? Because the conclusion was only induced, forced onto the brother, like a sister forces herself on the brother. The guy doesn't love her. She's the one forcing herself. A force, a force so <laughs> So for such a relationship between premises and conclusion, it is possible for you to accept the premises as true and yet the conclusion can be rejected as false and no contradiction whatsoever will be created. Maybe I should just tell you one or two examples and then Madame will do the reading. So Madame, read this one instead. Compare two types of arguments. 
uh, Miss Gift, uh, Miss Painter, I think. I think that the name was Gift, if I got it right. Yeah, Gift, go ahead. Finish that one before we finish. Yes. I'm wrapping up to you. Compared to types of arguments, Deductive one, all students write exams. Ama is a student, so she writes exams. Very good. Now, hold on, my lady, hold on for a minute. If I came to you and I said, All oh, women are cheated, everyone listen because I'm going to answer right now and I want a chorus answer. Okay, if I, I saw you and I told you, All oh, women are cheats, and your mother is a woman, what have I told you then? My mother is also a cheat. Mother, <laughs> if you are sitting by your mother, you have to, you have to check your, your cheek. Otherwise, we'll be judged. You see, all women are cheats. The person has come to stand by there. He said, You know, Kale, as for women, be so then they. Then they what? Oh, you don't be cheat. Women, then be cheat. Let's say that's what the guy said. Women are cheat. And then he goes further to tell. That's the first premise I gave you. First reason. Then he goes further and says, your mother too is a woman. Do you need him to now explicitly tell you that therefore your mother is a cheat? No. The premises already contain that conclusion. If it were true. If it were true. It may not be true, but if it were true that all women were cheat. And it was also true that your mother is not a transgender. <laughs> is a woman. Then what is true of all women must, there we go, must necessarily be true of your mother. Too. So as soon as you see the two premises, it already contains a conclusion. As soon as you collected the fruit, the orange fruit, you already took it home, what? The orange seed, simplicity. That is what makes such a reasoning a deductive one, a valid deduction at that. This is modus ponens. That we just did. So granted that you had the two premises, you can easily you see that you haven't even learned modus ponen. But because the thing is not, it's the way we think. I give you the two premises, you can deduce rationally the valid conclusion. Logician has only put names to them. One more. I'll give another example that I'll tell you which valid form is that, just so that you, you can have a teaser, then we move on. All politicians are corrupt. And all corrupt people are lecturers. <laughs> what conclusion can you draw? See, all A's are B's. Now use symbolism. And all B's are themselves C. I say everything again. All A's, whatever A stands for, doesn't matter. All A's are B's. If it were true that all A's are B's. And it were also true that all bees are themselves C. Then what valid conclusion can you draw from these two premises I've given you? I want your chorus answer. Hey, yes. All, 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 bees. And all, bees are C. Then what? Then all A's are C. Very good. That's hypothetical theology. You see, let's put flesh in now. All mangoes are fruits, and all fruits are nutritious. Then it means all mangoes are nutritious. That's what I've said, really. I start again. All mangoes are fruit, and all fruits are highly nutritious. Then it means I'm telling you that mangoes are highly nutritious. How did we come by this conclusion? The conclusion is not anything new. My friends, it's not any something new anyway. <laughs> not a new thing. It is already part of your premises. Granted that the premises were true. And so such a reasoning, the connection between the premises and the conclusion is a necessary one by force. Law. By force. I mean, you know, they are so tied together that. If you accepted the premises as true, it would mean that you must also accept the conclusion as true. That is what makes that reasoning deductive and a valid deduction at that. But look at Madame's second example. So the first example has that format. All students write exams, Amma is a student. Then what is true of all students will be true of Amma. She will write exams. Deduction. This is modus ponens. 
it was the antecedent that was affirmed right after the conditional. But don't worry. Let me throw a bit more. The second one says what? Let's read it together, everyone. On mute and read. Induction. Go. The people are alive as I have muted everyone. Keep it like that. I, I wanted you all to wake up just in case someone was asleep. I'm sure that not everyone is awake. Well done. Most, most Ghanaians are hospitable. Most. My mother is a Ghanaian. So the person is concluding that therefore she's hospital. Now, let's grant it to be true that most Ghanaians are hospital. I said, let's grant it. Let's assume it. Because it might be that most Ghanaians are not hospitable. You see, it may be that most Ghanaians are not hospitable. So we are only saying that you let's take it for granted that it were true that most Ghanaians are hospital. Premise one. Then, if it was true also that your mother is a Ghanaian, why do I say that? Because your mother may not be Ghanaian. Maybe your mother is Ivorian. That lied to us all this while. So there's a possibility of falsehood. But let's say that it were true. Why? For the sake of argument. If we granted both premises on your screen to be true, would it necessarily mean, therefore, that she is hospitable? Yes or no? Yeah. No. What's the correct answer? No. 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 Yeah. No. No. Yeah. no. Why are you saying yes? No. No. <laughs> it's, no. It's no. Okay. No. Most Ghanaians no. are hospitable. My mother is a Ghanaian. If most Ghanaians are hospitable, does it mean my mother too must necessarily be part of the most? Most means there can be some that are not. The one saying most has already admitted that some may not. Most doesn't mean all. Are you following? People, so if I say most Ghanaians are hospitable and I add extra information that my mother is a Ghanaian, you cannot therefore conclude that I have said necessarily that therefore my mother is hospitable. This conclusion, my mother is hospitable, does not follow necessarily. The key word is necessary, it's not a certainty, even if we granted all the premises to be true. It was still not necessarily follow. Why? Because it is possible from my own evidence I have presented. It is possible for my mother to be Ghanaian and yet not be hospitable. Why? Because my first premise said most, not all. So such a reasoning is inductive. The conclusion is forcing itself onto the premises. I've told you like the sister is forcing itself on some brother, which makes us all say we'll force to chop. When we induce vomiting, it means we the thing didn't, there wasn't the, 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 the person didn't feel like vomiting, but maybe he or she has taken poison. So we give some palm oil to induce vomiting, to force out the vomit. Inductive reasoning is just telling you that the conclusion was forced onto the thing, the premise. It wasn't taken from it. So whereas in the first instance, all students write exams, Amma is a student, so she writes exam. The conclusion to write exam was taken from the premises. And so the relationship is a necessary one and it's a valid deduction called modus ponens. The second one is not, it's not any of what I said. It's not even a deductive at all. And so with that, look at the third example here. Since the security man was the last person who left the building yesterday, he stole the project leader's laptop. Now, even if we took it to be true that the security man left last yesterday, does it then mean that he took a laptop necessarily? No. You see that? So this reasoning is induced. It's an inductive argument. But the second one says, still on your screen. Let's read that one two together. The all mangoes one. Go, so, question four. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much. So I'll mute it now. Yes, in the anti feedback. Now, what did we read for the sake of my special student? I want to touch on it again. All mangoes are fruit. My pen is not even a fruit. 
look, all mangoes, mangoes in Yenara are inside the set, the bigger set of what fruit. That's the first premise. So the subset of mangoes are inside the mother set of what fruit. The next premise says, my pen is not even a fruit. So my pen is outside the mother set. Totally out. Not just outside the set. That, is, that would have been a fallacy of denying the antecedent. But don't worry. It is outside the bigger mother set. Then it will mean that it can't be anywhere near the mango. Because mango nankata that is your boss. She herself is captured inside the mother set. So if my ex that I'm holding, the pen I'm holding, is not a fruit, that is it's outside of the mother set, then therefore it is not a mango. Because mango nankata is inside the mother set. You see, this is also valid. The conclusion is already part of the premise. If you plot the two premises, the conclusion will reveal itself. But this validity or form of validity, I, I told you about forms and patterns. Mm -hmm. This form of validity is not the same as the one we saw earlier. This one. The patterns are different. Uh, different. That's what we are going to give some time to either this week or from next week or what. For you to be able to determine a follow, uh, excuse me, an argument that is valid and distinguish it from one that is not valid. And the types of valid parts. So whereas example one that I'm projecting now is modus ponens, example four, still deductive, but it is what? Modus tollens, T for Timothy, tollens. Okay, now I, I shut up and then if you read the last one of this slide, then someone else will take over. If you read correct distinction, deduction and induction. Correct distinction. Deductive and inductive arguments. Deductive argument. An argument is deductive when the truth of the premises guarantee or proves the truth of the conclusion. In a good or valid in a good or valid deductive argument, if the premises are assumed to be true, then the conclusion must be necessarily true. In a valid deductive argument, it is impossible. It is impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false at the same time. If not, you create a contradiction. Very good. I've said everything on that slide. Does anyone have a question? I think it's a Rabna that I just read. Not Gifty. Am I right? Please, it was Gifty. Okay, then, then a Rabna, mute your thing. Okay, mute it. Huh. When we are ready to read, then you unmute. Does anyone have a question with that? Okay, so now you can dis clearly distinguish deduction from induction. That is why you shouldn't do what is on our screen now, which some authors have done. They do the di distinction between, or the contrast between deduction and induction. They do it wrongly. They say that deductive arguments move from general premises to particular conclusions. Well, inductive arguments move from particular premises to general conclusion. We say that is not exactly correct. That's ambiguous. If you say guys have long hair, uh, excuse me, guys have short hair and ladies have long hair, and that is what you are using to distinguish, contrast men from women, we are in big trouble. It's so ambiguous. You can have a lady with very short, elegant, chic hair, very feminine, and yet the hair is short. And you can have a brother who has a long, very masculine. I mean, the Jesus pictures we see, at least <laughs> as presented to us, has long hair. He's not a, a lady, he's a guy. So if someone did that distinction, he didn't help you. The correct way of distinguishing deduction from induction is the test we have given you. Just like if you want to determine if the substance has acid in it or not, you use the litmus test. If it turns red, as acid in the object. If it turns blue or whatever, then it feels or alkaline. You have to understand that's the correct way of doing the distinction. So you have to test it. Why? Because if I said Kofi is taller than Kwame, and Kwame is taller than Kojo, it will validly follow that Kofi is taller than Kojo. And none of those statements I've given you so far are general. They are all particular statements. Kofi is taller than Kwame. Kwame is taller than Kujo. What, therefore what? 
Therefore, Kofi, but each of the statements I gave you are particular. They are not generalizations. Yet, the argument is a deduction and a valid one of that. Okay, so we are trying to tell you that if you go by the criteria that was in certain terms telling us that a deductive argument has premises that are general and a conclusion that is particular. We say that is not correct. That is not correct because we can have particular to particular that are what? Deduction. And we can have general statement to particular conclusion, which you would think is deduction per this distinction. But lo and behold, it's not deduction. So general premises leading to particular conclusion, yet the argument is inductive. Really? Someone will say, oh, yes. An example is this. Look on your screen, the one you just read. Most Ghanaians are hospitable. Most. My mother is a Ghanaian, therefore she's hospitable. This argument moves from general premises, particular conclusion, and yet it is clearly inductive. Okay. What have we done so far? We have revi uh, revised or if like reviewed, recalled arguments, its parts, the types. That's what you see on your screen. Get it now. Two, what have we learned? How to distinguish the two types of arguments correctly, we've learned that, and then incorrectly, as has been done by others, we learned that. Okay. We know formal fallacies as what? Errors that occur when you deviate from the correct patterns for valid deduction, and you deviate from them, and you create something alternative to that. We we'll say you have disobeyed the form, so you've committed a fallacy or the form. Then we have seen the names of the, the valid logistic patterns, modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive syllogism. We are, we are going to see the content of, uh, we've done deduction versus induction, now I'm going up. We have gone through arguments, and then we have instances of deduction and induction at play. Now, we saw the error in how deduction and induction have been contrasted. There's an error if you say that a deductive argument moves from general premises to particular conclusion, whilst the other one moves from particular premises to general conclusion. We say that is not exactly correct. And that's what your screen has here. Okay, always remember that deduction is topic neutral as well. We saw this concept earlier. When you are deducing, it doesn't focus on what the topic or the subject matter or content. Mm. So I can say all butterflies are pens. My mother is a butterfly. It will follow that my mother is a what? A pen. Do you, do you get the point? I could say all tables are chairs. And my lecture is a table. Therefore, conclude for me, therefore. It's a chair. 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 It's a I'm not concerned about the content, whether the content is actually true or it is actually false. No. I'm just assuming that if this happened and that one also happened, then this will follow. That's the whole thing about validity, uh, deduction, and so on and so forth. I want to lower all the hands for a minute and take your questions if you have them. Okay. So all hands are down now. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Let me take it before we move on to the next stage. Any question? All right. Then we can continue. Now, I'll take Rosina. Rosina, please, your turn to read now. We want to see what makes a, a statement particular or general because it has come up strongly in how we conceive of what? 
uh, inductive argument. We, we think we have shown an instance where we are moving from general premises to particular conclusion. And yet what we have there is not a deduction, but rather an induction. Please go ahead. Understanding particular versus general statements. Every statement proposition has two parts, the reference class and the attribute class. Example, that man is a bully. That man is the reference class. Since that man is specific, accountable, and finite, we describe these statements as particular statements. Example, men are bullies. Men in the reference class. Since men is not specific, not countable, and is infinite, we describe these statements as a generalization. Very good. So from this discussion, I on your screen, I'm sure everyone knows a generalization now and you can distinguish it from particular statements. Let me see if I can throw a little bit more light on it. What are the parts of a statement in English? We have subject well, and predicate. Did so you have a question? Was well, is there a question you had? Somebody was asking me a question, so I stopped. Okay, maybe it wasn't. So I was saying that when we do English, if I say Kofi is a boy, you say the subject is Kofi, the predicate is it's a boy, right? The same way when I say um, that man is the dean of students, what's the subject that man? What's the predicate dean of students? See that. Now, the logician will call this expression, instead of saying um, subject, he will say reference class, the reference. What am I referring to? Oh, I'm referring to Kofi, because I said what well, Kofi is a boy. So who am I referring to? I'm referring to Kofi, reference. Then what did I say about Kofi? What the English person would say, or the English, if I'm doing English, I'll say predicate. The logician will say, what am I attributing to Kofi? What are you claiming about Kofi? See that. So what? So the logician will have reference class and attribute class. Attribute class. Please learn this one very well. Going to serve you well also with unit seven. I told you, your, your colleagues yesterday. When, when I made a band group, I said what we are learning for this, this particular versus general, is the whole subject matter of Unit 7. The science, the sciences and everyday life. Unit 7 is doing justice. Unit 7 is using empirical content, predictive power, physical ability, pseudo-scientific, all those concepts border on the reference class you are dealing with. So you have to understand it now, not only for Unit 6 and Moodle Spooners and Co, but also for Unit 7. I told your friends, so we'll do like stew, we'll stew it well, use some for the yam today, then keep the other half stuck somewhere in the fridge for a jollof in the morning. <laughs> and they, I think it makes a, a lot of good, good sense. Okay, so what? So instead of saying subject and predicate, the logician says reference class and attribute class. Every statement then has a reference class and its attribute. What you are referring to. I don't know your reference. What are you referring to? I'm referring to that man. Who are you referring to? I'm referring to that man in that room. Uh, now, when you have a reference class, that is what countable and finite. You will finish counting it. And you will end. The key word there is finite. It has an end. What I'm referring to, I can finish counting if I were to count. It is not potentially open-ended, but it can be counted and you can complete. Then that expression becomes what a particular statement. That man, uh, one, you can count. All the men in that room said they want another meal. 
all the men there, there. All the men in that room. Men, what's had any money in our city? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna put down the book. All the men, that's particular. Okay, now contrast that with a kind of statement that has what? A reference class that is infinite, infinite. See that? Uncountable, potentially will never end. Like the example, the men are bullies. Who are you referring to? We are referring to men. That is men of all times, all places, born and dead already, yet to be born. They're speaking like God. Eternity past, eternity present, eternity future. That is a generalization, brothers and sisters, in the law. <laughs> you don't speak like that. You are not good. Women have done this. Politicians have done that. Lecturers have done this. Hey, was how many have you met? That's what women. If you saw them, they you too. A girl after hasn't responded to your proposal before. You don't have the vim to come. come. But then you go, <laughs> you know, parading a, a cliche, carrying it along and saying something. You too, the sister to say, a man, man, yes, me, me, the extract ones. As for men, they are not reliable. How many have whistled at you? You don't know them. How many have you met? As a whole point, some haven't even been born yet. The boy that is now going to grow up to become a man is captured in your sentence, and the attribute you have is supposedly true of a being that hasn't even taken on form yet. That's a generalization. So we have general statements and particular statements. And that is what All right. So so that is a generalization. And we don't want people generalizing. But that is not for another day. When we look at informal palatis, you see in unit 10. Uh, hasty generalization. For now, we are showing you how to distinguish a statement that is particular from one that is general. It will help you see why, for example, the wrong categorization between deduction and induction came about. How did it come up? Because a person's conception of what general statement is, is fault, and you use it for other things. Okay, so men are bullies. The reference class is men, and that is infinite. It doesn't have a name. Now, there are two types of generalization. When I say men are bullies, I'm, I'm referencing a class that is general, men. When I say some men are bullies, so the class I'm referring to is general. Can you say it's general? So both of them are generalization. But the first one, get me, the first one, doesn't exempt anyone from the reference class. Maybe one of you should read that for me, okay? Raise your hand if you, it was Rosina reading. Rosina, read for me. Types of generalization, universal and statistical. Universal or law like generalization. The attitude applies to all means that infinite reference class. That is, no one is exempted. Example, men are bullied. Statistical generalization. The attribute applies only to a subset of the infinite reference class. That is, some are exempted, but the class is so infinite. Therefore, a generalization. Example, some men are bullied. Note, the reference class tells you whether a statement is general or particular, as well as the type of generalization. Well done. So if you know the reference class, then you are able to tell whether the statement is general or particular. But not just that. Then it helps you go further. It helps you go further to also tell the type of generalization. Okay. Now, some examples will help you. I said, no, first, whether it is. Oh, oh. I'm going to do it myself, otherwise. <laughs> My dear friend, statistical generalization versus universal or law like generalization. If it is like a law, 
We will leave no one out. There is no exception to that. No exception to the general set. That is what makes it a law-like or universal general. Law-like or universal general. For us, for statistical, even though the set is general, the attribute doesn't affect everybody because of how the person is speaking. Okay, so the attribute affects only a subset of that group. And that is what makes it a statistical generalization. We want to practice and see if we got it before we move on. Remember reference class and attribute class. Okay, on our screen now. Look at example one. Let's read it together. Everyone go. I'm you can read. Example one. I want to see. Okay. The disease is contagious. The disease is contagious. The disease is contagious. Some people are living far away from. All right. Thank you all so much. Now listen. The disease is contagious. When I say the disease is contagious, what am I referring to? I'm referring to. The disease. Is that general or particular? Particular. Particular. Very good. Very good. The chorus answers are good, okay? For some of the for some of the topics, you see that I do that a lot. There's a reason. So that I can get feedbacks from a good number of you. And then I'm, I can check if we are covering what we want to cover together. Not that a few people know it. Okay. I can see your faces, so it helps us to work that way. Now, if I say the disease, I'm speaking for all a, a specific disease. I can finish counting it. That's look on my screen. The disease is contagious. The disease, that disease, you know, it is contagious. So it's particular. I'm referring to something that is. Specific. Something that I can finish count. I said the specific doesn't help some people. When they hear specific, even if you say men are bullies, they say yes, you specify. I'm talking about men, not men and women. You see, they get confused. So I teach it with the word the finite. Finite helps you see it better. Finite meaning if you were counting the reference class, you would finish counting. Okay. So if I said the disease is so and so and so, if you were counting. You would finish counting the disease. Definite article there. Got it? Good. Now let's check what happens with the example two. Few Ghanaians like pineapple. If I said few Ghanaians like pineapple, is that general? What is the reference like? Somebody's general. It's allergic. Few Ghanaians are allergic. Wait, wait for a minute. That's Somebody's background is very... No, no, yeah, I don't know if it's yours. I hope it's not. No, it's not yours. Because I've muted all in spite now. Okay, I want the chorus answers. But if you don't trust your background, I'm using an earphone. It's quite PSC. Yeah, so you don't destroy my life. <laughs> hey. And I'm you destroying your time. You oh, let's be... You got it. You got it. I like to buy an apple. Okay, if I say few Ghanians... Is that general or particular? Particular. What is the reference class? What is the reference class? Few Ghanians. Few Ghanians. You have all Ghanians. It is a generalization. Yes. You Some are exempted. Listen. The reference class first, before you qualify it, find out whether it is general or particular. Confirm the reference class. You have to make sure that you are dealing with the reference class. Mm -hmm. If you get the reference class, it helps you to know whether it is general or particular. It is what I am referring to. So if I say few Ghanaians are so and so, what am I referring to? Ghanaians. I'm referring to Ghanaians. I only qualified it. I only qualified it, but I'm referring to Ghanaians of all times, all places, born already, yet to be born. 
Okay. Asanto. Madam. I'm disabling your mic for a minute, eh? Yeah, the feedback is so bad. Uh -huh. I think it, that was the problem. Listen up. Few Ghanaians. So the reference class is Ghanaian, but I have qualified it. So it is a generalization, yes, but a generalization that exempts some members from this. So which type of generalization would that be? Everyone, on you to answer. Statistic. Statistical generalization. Very good. That is it. It's a statistical generalization. If you got that, if you got that, then we are good to go. Now, what about four? So look, I'll, I'll just actually look at the first one. We've done the first, we've done the second. Look at the third. The liquid in that bowl is poisonous. General or particular? Particular, 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 Okay, very good. The last one, I have an example four. Keep quiet, guys. Those who, don't, those who are not part of the class, can you keep muted? If you want to chat, you can chat, but let the, your colleagues have their class here. Eh? I'm asking, how about the fourth one? Let's see, is the fourth one? Green tables, uh -huh. green tables are scarce these days. Is that general or particular? The generalization. Everyone keep listening, okay? That's why I asked for the chorus answer. You see, you see, if I ask only one person, should I say oh, particular? Then I think oh, everyone got it. And already we are over 250. You see, but if you open it once in a while like that, it gets and then everybody's participating. It helps you see. Hey, no, 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 I have to hit this part a bit more. Green tables are costly these days. Green tables of all times, all places. See that green table? That's the reference. I'm referring to green tables. That is a universal generalization. The general system, uh, we are used to speaking that way. That's why we are working on ourselves. People speak that way. They think they were speaking about something that is specific and measurable. Not at all. Okay, so that was a generalization. All voters prefer a recount of ballots. Example six, general or particular? Particular. General. 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 Very good. How about seven? General. Seven says all the voters, all the voters, General interviewed said they would prefer a recount of the ballot. My brother, why you say general? Why are you people saying general? Why? Who are saying general? Why? Who are saying general? Why? You should be. We are developing the critical thinking skill in you. You have to be alert. Ah, when people speak, hear them. Is that all the voters interviewed? That's example seven. All the voters interviewed said, the people we interviewed, we say general. Huh? That is not, I don't know. That is, you are not allowing yourself to look closely. And that's another thing. See that I paused and I want to be strong in language. I want you to be alert. Yes, I better that. Open your eyes. Okay. All the voters interviewed said they will prefer a recount of the ballot. How can that be general? Because you saw all. No, you have to be smart. Okay. No student registers unless false. Is that general or particular? General. 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 Very good. Very good. Then the last, last but one now. That is general. Good. That's general. Then we'll look at. General. Then we'll look at. Okay. Then we'll look at the next. One, the last but one. None of the students in that class registered for the course. General or particular? 
general. I hear, I still hear people saying general. Example nine. Look at nine. I've expanded it. None of the students Particular. in that class. Particular. 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 Very good. Particular. Particular. Very last one. It's okay. Thank you very much. I think you are doing well. Which is good. If you get this, you have done more than 60% of unit seven. You will see it when we get there. It's all about reference class, unit seven. Then we will look at the last one. It says 80% of all retail stones are not real diamonds. Is it? Listen to my question and answer what I'm asking. So that I don't do the same thing the exam. Answer the question that you have been asked, not the lectures you have attended. <laughs> so I said, 80% of all retail stones are not real diamonds. Is this general or particular? General. 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 Type of generalization is correct. It's general. Now, which type of generalization? Okay. Now, what if I had changed example 10 to read this way? Everyone be, be listen with rapt attention. Suppose I turned 10 and it reads this way. 80% of all the retail stones in my mother's shop are not real them. Not rich them. That's particular. Um, particular. 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 You see how you particular. have developed a skill? Yes. You are, you are now listening with a little bit more rapt attention than you would have done when you started the course. 80% of all the retail stones in Ghana are not real diamonds. That is a particular statement. It means we can directly test it. You see that in unit seven, when we do science in everyday life. You see that such a statement can be tested so the investigator can go to the field and test it directly. You see? All the women have been with were cheats. You can tell that just put CCTV cameras in the offices or in, in, in your room when you are going and see if a guy will come and play around with them. You can directly test. Because I said all the women are the women. I know you directly test them. See that? This is a gist from unit seven. But if I say all women are cheats, how do you directly test all women? If some are not born yet. Some are babies on their mommy's lap, baby girls, going to grow up. So this attribute you are making, or you are, you know, at a, what is the expression? You are laying on them. You are making an attribution to women. How do we test it? Because some are not even say, all women are this. All men have done that. All the lecturers have done this. All the students have done this. How do you ever finish checking? Because even the reference we are dealing with, we don't have them all at once. Potentially, there will be more. That's the problem with speaking generally. So you, because you cannot test such statements directly, what do you do? You test them indirectly. You use some to represent all, like democracy. <laughs> you know what that means. When you don't see your MP, but it's in parliament saying things supposedly for you. That's what happens when you send your questionnaires out and sample out some views from students about patching. And then you come and draw a conclusion analysis and say, Ligon students say they like patching or they don't like it, or they want school fees increased, increased over time. Some people say, they say, what? Who did they ask? Nobody asked me anything. Well, <laughs> some reps have spoken for you through your questionnaire. What? When you do generalization, whether statistical or law like, <laughs> excuse me. You are unable to directly test that is unit seven. I want you to see what you use this raw material for. Right now, you think you are just grinding paper. Wait until we start stirring the jello <laughs> and stirring it left, right, center. You see that? Hey, so the pepper and tomatoes, this is where it was taking us. Yes. Okay. 
We don't test general statements directly, whether it is statistical or what's the other one? Universal. No, you only test Universal. them what? Indirectly. You use indirect tests, meaning you can take a few, what you find to be true about the few, you impose it or project it onto the whole. That's why it could fail. Remember unit five. Now we go back. See that unit five. So empirical laws, for instance, which are only describing what we have observed so far, we learn that they are predictions. Oh, yes, the metal, one metal can be discovered in the future that will not expand even when you heat it. So your claim that all metals expand when heated is built on what? An assumption from what? The few instances you have, a subset, so to speak. Back to where we are now. Just some light ahead and light behind you. For you to see. So when I say 80% of all retail stones, that is not the same as 80% of all the retail stones in Obwasi. See the difference? One, you can send a dispatch rider, go there and do some you know monitoring and check. We can directly do a check. The other one, you can directly test such a statement. So potentially it already has what falsehood. What you can do is only improve upon the degree of likelihood. The chances are that if a child grows in a broken home, he or she may become a social deviant. It is a degree matter, a matter of probability. Probability is never equal to one. That's why you don't make your scientific, I'm talking about empirical science now, your empirical science predictions as if they were certainties. Science is not dogma. All of that will be coming from how you interpret statements and what they are referencing and how you are grounding that claim. Okay, so you got that. And what we'll get you in the seven, we should have an interesting time as well. Now, some few other additions that we are ready from the modus ponens in total, right? You see, universals are either affirmative or negative. Now, when I say universals, you don't need further and better particulars. We have dealt with them. You know, both the statistical type of generalization, and then the universal one that we call law like as well, okay? Now, it is no longer statistic, I'm talking what? Universal generalization. All oh, so, so and so have done so, so and so. All oh, so and so and so have done that. That's what you see on your screen now. So Ghanaians are hospitable, they're saying all Ghanaians are hospitable. Now, that is in fact, make your note now, very important, universals, are either affirmative, positive, or negative. So if I say no cat is a dog, I'm still making a universal claim, but I'm speaking in the negative. That's said to be a disjoint set. Those who like math, you understand that. Then that. Okay? No cat is a dog. You draw a set to represent cats. Let's say that set is a circle. So you name it T for cat, that circle. Then the other set is a square, it will represent dogs. And you make sure that they don't touch each other. That's the correct representation of what? No cat is a dog. That means if it is a cat, then it is not a dog. This joint set, they don't connect. That's how you interpret a universal negation. But Doc, why are you talking interpretation now? Because you're going to use it to do modus ponens and modus tollens. All these are ingredients. We grounded a pepper, we cut the contemporary, uh, we build a yam, we did this. We are now going to cook the meal. These are just raw material. When we finish cooking the meal, then we set it. The meal ultimately should be either modus ponens or modus tollens, depending on who's, who's good at chest or hypothetical syllogism. So we and a bank or yam and parabasot or something. But the starting point, we are cutting onions, we are doing this. That's why you are doing all this one. Now what? So you have to know how to interpret a universal negation. How will you interpret something that you don't even know what it is? So you have to know a universal negation. See that? That's what you see on your screen down there. The last three are examples of universal negation. No man is perfect. It means, how do you interpret it? You rewrite it, you read as a conditioner. If, write it down, please. Then X is not perfect. That's what this means. If I say no man is perfect, I'm saying if X is a man, then X is not perfect. No cat is a dog, and swear. 
It means if X is a cat, then it is not a dog. If you don't expand it well, when we start affirming antecedent and denying consequence, you will struggle, sir, like a sister who didn't do the cassava, the initial pounding well, where you crack the, the you know, the, the cassava into soap. You are pounding food. When it's time for you to do the, uh, you know, mixture, ah, you do so much work. You just remove, keep removing lamps. When, when others are done and they cleared up, you are still sitting there. Because you did a lazy job at start. <laughs> so when you start, you want to make sure you have hit the, the cassava well and spread it all out nicely. And all the lamps are out. When it's time to mix with plantain, it's easy. You just do the water thing and then get the consistency you want. You mold your cocoon nicely and you're out. But you start, you are just gathering cassava and plantain, missing them. Boom, 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 boom. When it's time for you to now get the cocoon bit, you will see the lamps like tennis ball. They will be all over. What then is the point? It's important to get the basic so that when we start building on it, and I say, now deny your antecedent, let me see. You see that you just slow. So what am I teaching you now? I said, write it. I know a thousand and one people may not write. No problem. Maybe your mind is fast. If I say no man is perfect, I have just given you a universal negative statement. That universal negation, look on my screen, I'm moving. A universal negation can become this. See how we expand a universal negation. My slide number 17 tells you. I shared my slide on the site for all students. So I, I believe that you all see what I'm showing. If I say no man is perfect, it is a conditional statement. How do you know that? It means if X is a man, then X is perfect. Excuse me, X is not perfect. <clears throat> if X is a man, then X is not perfect. The negation goes into the consequence, not. Well, now, if I say no cats are dogs, you want to say it using if then. That's a conditional. You want to rewrite it to expose it as what? A conditional statement. That way you can clearly show your antecedent, the A clause. Then you can show your consequent, the 10 clause. Then you are ready to mix, mix and create your meal. Okay. So no cats are dogs is expanded to read as what? If X is a cat, then what? X is not a dog. What about no humans have feathers? Let me cover it. If I say no humans have feathers, you want to rewrite it as a conditional. How would you say it? If X is a human. Very good. Then X does not have feathers. Or then X has no feathers. You have captured it right. Let's do some more. So on the investor negation. So you can clearly show your antecedent and your consequence. So some more investor negations. See the ones I have here. No cats require vaccination. Excuse me. No goats require vaccination. Expand it to read as a conditional. Let me see. If X expects goats, then if X, 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 X does not require vaccination. If X is a goat, then X does not require vaccination. Well done. How about? How about? No politician. It's poor. I want a, a chorus answer again. If X is a politician, then X is not poor. So you can expand a universal negation so you can clearly tell what your antecedent is and what your consequence is. Now, what is the antecedent? Antecedent is just the if clause. You don't add the if. The if points you to the antecedent. So if I say, if you study, then you will pass the exam. That you study is your antecedent. I hope you see that. Then you will pass is your consequence. If you study, then you will pass. Your antecedent is you study. The consequence is you will pass. How do you know that the if shows you antecedent? So I could have said you will pass if you study. 
the if has gone to the second part, no problem. Wherever it is, is not the issue. As soon as I see my if, what follows that statement becomes what my antecedent. Then the other one becomes the consequence. Okay, so everyone tell me the antecedent of this statement. Whenever it rains, the ground gets wet. It rains. Well it done. Rains. That was excellent. The gentleman did well. The ground gets wet is constant. I thought you say whenever it rains. Then I'll say that whenever it rains, it can be true or false. But he took off the whenever <laughs> nicely. Well done. Well done. Okay. So it rains is your antecedent. Okay. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. That's a scripture. You love, love, you love me. Love you love me. Love me. Love me. Well done. Love me. Well done. Well done. Put it well done. Okay. So if you love me, then you obey my commandment. The antecedent is what you love me. What? Last one. If you do not have a passport, then you cannot travel. What is your antecedent? You do not have a passport. You do not have a passport. Very good. Well done. So you people are, are massaging your muscles on antecedent and consequence. I, I can do a very last one. Then now we, we, we polish up our understanding of consequence. Okay. okay. Ready? You're almost done, and eh? now you're staring the bank to on the fire. The whole tree is boiling fine. Don't finish our say, but I mean, oh, you love it. <laughs> the last one. Whenever prices of goods and services are increased, people buy less. Whenever prices of goods and services are increased, people buy less. What is the antecedent right. of this statement? Well done. Very good. That's what I want you to do. Okay. Now we are well vexed. We are well vexed in our antecedent, identify antecedent. So let's do some consequence too. If you love me, then you'll obey my commandment. What's the consequence of this statement? You will obey my commandment. You will obey my commandment. You will obey my commandment. Well done. Well done. You will obey my commandment. If you do not have a passport, you cannot travel. What's the consequence? You cannot travel. Well done, everyone. I think we are carrying ourselves well. So I just muted well. everyone. When I mute you, everyone. <laughs> when I mute, don't unmute. Eh? We can do it a little at a time. So I, can, I, can. Okay. I want you to practice. That's why I can keep a silent class throughout. But that, that's not a rationale. So what we are doing is very healthy. It's, it's one of one to keep you on your toes. Two, you feel a part of the class. And three, you can easily detect what you are not too strong with or on. Then you seek help. Your TA, your TA Ms. Benice, is online. She can even tell that, ah, I think maybe you have to polish up this one a bit more. Okay? So we'll keep working that way. But now you know antecedent and you know consequence. And you can affirm, and, and we are, I'm not totally affirming yet. You, if, whether the antecedent is negative or positive, you know that this is the antecedent and this is the consequence. You can expand universal negations and you can also expand universal affirmative. I think I should confirm that. So if I said all mangoes are fruits, this is a universal affirmative. How would you expand it using the variable X? If X is a mango, then X is a mango, X is a fruit, and X is a fruit. Well done. Well done, everyone. So just so that others who don't know what is going on, <laughs> they are still the remnant of Israel all the time, you see. Remnant of Israel. When, <laughs> when people are good, they are. So listen, my, my dear remnant, just in case they are remnant, don't worry. They're young to shall go, eh? What I asked your friends was, if you hear this, all mangoes are fruits, and you want to use if then, the clause, the, the conditional statement to expand it, 
How should you do it? All mangoes are fruit. That's a universal affirmative. So you say, if X is a mango, then X is a fruit. So that X is a mango becomes your antecedent and X is a fruit becomes your consequence. That's all we did. It could have been me, a universal negation. Then we'll say, for example, no pen, excuse me, no pen is a fruit. No human has feathers. Let's use that one. No human has feathers. That is just saying that if X is a human, then X will not have feathers. See that they're not went into the consequence. That's how I interpret a universal negation. Now, I showed you that if you have a universal negation, it is a disjoint set. Picture it in your mind. It will help you understand why you shouldn't negate the antecedent and think it will be valid. It will explain to you why you shouldn't affirm the consequent and think that that will lead to validity. If you do them, it will be negative. You will get it wrong because of the meanings of the universal. So I try to help students see that. If you have a universal negation, it is a disjoint set, meaning if I say, for instance, no humans have feathers, I'm saying that there are two sets, a set of humans and a set of beings that have feathers. So you can represent a set of humans with a circle and label it H humans, okay? Then the set of feathered entities, things that have feathers, you can label that as what F and it is a square. So circle and square. Now, if I said no humans have feathers, if you are representing that on the Venn diagram, this will be two different sets without any intersection. They don't connect. That's why we interpret it to say if X is a human, then X will not have feathers. This joint set. How about the universal affirmative one? All mangoes are fruits. That one, if you represent it on the Venn diagram, it's a subset. Mangoes are inside the universal set of what? Fruits. Inside that universal set, there is space for bananas too. Even though bananas and mangoes are not the same, they share in what? The universal set. Everyone listens, it's a community. So mangoes are fruits doesn't prevent bananas also from being fruit. It doesn't prevent watermelons or tangerines. My friend B said, or oh, onion. I said, oh, and onion is fruit. Yeah. We started laughing. These different specific sets of fruit will all belong to the big mother set called fruit. Understand that. So if I say all mangoes are fruit, I have not said, I have not said that what well, all fruits are mangoes. That's not what I said. I said, it is all mangoes that are fruits. That doesn't mean all fruits are mangoes. So if you say all women are cheats, it doesn't prevent men also from being cheats. There's space enough in the set of cheats for men, <laughs> for men also. You get a point? Understand the logic before you do the mechanics. If you are just doing the mechanical patterning, you get it, you get a pattern, it's also there. You get the patterns, but you won't understand the logic behind it. You have to understand the reasoning behind it. And then now when you do the if e, then QP, therefore Q, it makes sense. Therefore, on your screen now, see, if I say Ghanaians are hosp hospitable, I have not said hospitable people are Ghanaians. No. One is a subset of the other. Which one is a subset? The antecedent is inside the consequence. If I say Christians worship on Sundays, it doesn't prevent occultists also from worshiping on Sundays. They could also. There's space in the set of those who worship on Sunday. Same with alcoholics are womanizers. It doesn't mean womanizers are alcoholics. Wow. Oh, yes. That's how we think. If I've been thinking like that, uh, that's why I have my parasol in hand. I'm washing your brains. <laughs> like, hey, I'm, I'm detergent. Me, Pia, man, I have to coffee, 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 coffee. Then now you can do proper analysis. Okay. That oh, alcoholic uh, alcoholics are womanizers doesn't mean I have said that womanizers are alcoholics. Because rich guys can also be womanizers and they have nothing to do with alcohol. They don't like it. Maybe health, maybe because of their elegance, 
They don't take alcohol, but they could be very much inside the set of humanizers and yet have nothing to do with alcohol. So what? Simple food, simply put. Simply put, when I say alcoholics are humanizers, the antecedent is what? X is an alcoholic. The consequence is S is a womanizer. Now we are ready to do some good job. Any question before I, I go now straight forward to modus ponens and tool lens and what have you, wherever we get to post. I think we've done some good progress so and we've made some good progress. I didn't expect that we'll get this far. We haven't rushed either. I've been patiently teaching. But we will do the first two, maybe modus ponens and tool lens, and then we can revert to the other one. I see two hands up. If there are questions, let me take them before we go straight to the patterns, the valid patterns. Uh, Sharon first, and then Mary Mansa, then I'll go to Maxwell, in that order. Sharon, ask your question, if it's a question. Okay, then let me take Mary's own. Everyone is muted, so Mary, go ahead. Um, was there a question? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's no. fine. Then, that's then fine. I can take. Okay. Okay. All right. Then we will move straight forward to the valid part. Let me make sure I've covered everything. So you know, universal negation. All the things I said, just in case you need to brush up a bit more. That is it. See your slide number fifteen is there. Antecedent, consequent, mm, where you have. It already in a conditional form, you can easily find your antecedent and consequent where they gave you the raw material, the feathered chicken from the market that you have to kill it, dress it, defeather it, you know, and cut it into pieces, remove the bile, whoo, cut off the leg, pull the blah, blah, blah. You can still do it. That means I gave you a universal statement and you have to expand it and expose the conditional part eh, and show its antecedent and consequent before you can work with it. But I could also have given you a dressed chicken already. That is where I would have given you the conditional as it is raw like that. If A, then B. A, therefore B, that, that way. Okay. Either way you are, you are well poised to work with. Then there's the investor negation I just showed you. I have already mentioned, even at the introduction, that a syllogism just means what? Two premises leading to what? A single conclusion. In a deduction, not in an induction. If it's an induction, you can't call it a syllogism. But if it's a deduction that has two premises and a single conclusion, three steps, two premises, one conclusion, then we'll call it a syllogism. Now, something you already know, but I still felt I should put it there as a reminder. If the original statement is positive, then its negation will be negative. If Kofi is a student, is original statement given to you. Then when I say negate Kofi is a student, it will become Kofi is not a student. See that? Please, are you following? You are, you are all asleep now. Hey, wake them up for me. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Ah, you are there. Oh, OK, I just being quiet. I hear you. <laughs> OK, if you are not asleep, there is good news. So see, if in your original statement, I said, if Kofi writes exams, then Kofi is a student. If Kofi writes exams, then Kofi is a student. What's the antecedent of that? Everyone. Well done, everyone. That's the antecedent. Everyone. What's the consequence? What's the consequence? Okay. Okay. Now, now you will need to understand negation because of what? Modus tollens. One of the valid patterns operates with negation. It is a modus, but not ponens. This one is the tollens. Okay, I call them Paul and Timothy. <laughs> modus ponens is modus Paul, and then modus tollens is the Timothy one. The Timothy one, the pattern tells you negate, negate. So you have to practice your skill of negating, like fermenting the fish before you use it. 
some meals one fermented fish is amazing. <laughs> like yam and palaga sauce without more money. Why would you ferment that thing? Oh, Charlie, that is what gives us the premium. Look at our The one and I esther. So some meals want that thing fermented. No problem. We will give them fermented meals. So we have to know how to negate, turn the thing upside down. For especially who modu stolen. Timothy one. Okay. So what? So suppose I had said, if Kofi is not a student, then he is a tailor. If Kofi is not a student, then he is a tailor. So no, 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 a student. Then the no, no, a tailor. Then the legit student, a legit tailor. If Kofi is not a student, then he is a tailor. Suppose that is what I said. What would be our antecedent? Kofi is not a student. Very good. You are following. Well done. Kofi is not a student. Our consequent is what? Then our consequent is what? Then our consequent is what? He is a student. Very good. Very good. So you can still see antecedent and consequent. Now, you see the statement I just gave you. Suppose I said negate. Everybody listen. Suppose I said the statement was if Kofi. Everybody listen, don't, don't play now. If Kofi is not a student, then he is a tailor. That's the statement we are working with now. Suppose I said negate your consequent only. How will it read now? If Kofi he is not a tailor. Very good. Very good. I think my question was ambiguous, but I got answers that show me that you understand. Some did a whole statement, but this time negating the consequence. Others just pick the consequence and negate it. I think you both did fine. I was just trying to see if you know consequence and you can negate it. So the one who said Kofi is not a tailor has done well. He picked the consequence and negated it. Negating just means, therefore, that what I gave you, you know, the original, you know, turn it logically upside down. So because the consequent originally said Kofi is a tailor, its negation would work. Kofi is not a tailor. I think I'll, I'll share your recording rather, because I've been very patient and you people have been cooperatively fine. In the okay. Look, the original said Kofi is not. Excuse me, the original said Kofi is a tailor. So the negation of that would be what? Kofi is not a tailor. Now, suppose I had said the original now, so that you do the negation. The original said Kofi does not have a passport. So let's say if you have a passport, then you can travel. But now I'm giving a statement whose consequences Kofi does not have a passport. Consequent now, okay? Kofi does not sorry, have a passport. If I ask you to negate that, what will it become? Kofi has a passport. So you see what you did? Kofi has a passport. You just applied nege nege po. Yeah, That's what you did. Smart. Double negation. So you, you negated the negation. That's why it became Kofi has a passport. This is what happens when you have Imodu stolen. Negation. That's what the problem is for most people. <laughs> the problem is not with uh, modus ponens and co. For students who are, you know, some don't learn anything. So that's why you live there. You need to be laughing here in trouble. <laughs> Listen, you see that? Those who are studying, they do, but some people study, but the negation, when they negate the thing, or they deal with universal negation, nah, then the thing becomes, all of a sudden, everything is bled. They can't see again. That's why I've taken time to do the fermentation with what I call negation. Now we are good to go. So what is the pattern called modus? Eji, Prisla. What are the patterns called? Yeah, she's laughing at me. Modus ponens. Now we are ready. See, look at what modus ponens. As soon as we have a universal statement, if you study, then you will pass. What does it tell us to do next? It says, say, 
bring the antecedent next right after your universal statement. The next premise must affirm the antecedent. Bring the antecedent as it was given to you. Don't do anything to it. Don't negate it. Don't do anything. So if it was originally positive, bring that statement there. If it was originally negative, ah, well, eh, adara, odiane sa woma miya wunye fenme muna tu. See that? <laughs> Just pick what is there and bring this. We are learning modus ponens. That's all. So see the first premise. All mangoes are fruits. The next thing I say, this thing is a mango. Why that? But well, that is the antecedent. Therefore, it is a fruit. Valid. What you just did was, right after the investor statement, you affirmed the antecedent. You established the antecedent. You need to. So the conclusion also affirmed the consequence. The name of the argument is gotten from what the second premise. It's the premise that is naming the argument. The reason why we call it affirming the antecedent because of what you did after we gave you the universal statement. What did you do to it? Did you roast it or you fried it? Oh, this, we fried the chicken. That's why it's called fried. The one who collected the same chicken, starting point, but put it in the oven, roasted it or grilled it. So it is chicken, yes, but one is grilled, one is fried, one is, one is boiled. <laughs> that is what is naming the argument to Tom, not the conclusion, not the conclusion. The conclusion comes. It follows it. You don't, you don't do anything. It comes by itself. So the name of the argument is not about the conclusion. It's about the second premise. Now we are calling modus ponens what? Affirming the antecedent valid pattern. That means as soon as you were given the universal statement, the modus, what did you do? You went to bring the antecedent nest. And then you copied the same thing and then concluded with the concept. That pattern of reasoning is valid. It's called modus ponens. Who can ever forget it? Nobody. Unless the people follow you, they are in Kambu. <laughs> so what? So if I say, if you study, then you will pass. Modus ponens premise, the next one will say, Kofi studied, therefore he passed. Someone will say, Kofi studied, therefore he has passed. It's correct. Could be steady, he shall pass. Correct. Could, it, could be steady, he is passing. These are the tenses we are looking at. We are looking at the logic. So, antecedent nest affirmed, not negated, but affirmed. You bring it as it was, then you conclude. When you do that, you have you, you have done the modus ponens pattern and you have done it what correct. So, everybody try this quickly. Pa. Lectures like money. Use Nancy, don't worry. I'm fine with it. Okay, lectures like money. <laughs> Everybody write it down. <laughs> what should be the next next premise? Mm -hmm. Nancy is a lecturer. I'm going to mark your work. You before you see. Make it too much. I Listen. <laughs> so you, you see, I got it easy. You that and NS. I'm coming to use you for example. <laughs> so listen now. Look at the next one. All women will go to heaven. Then I conclude. I'm trying to create an entermim. That's what I'm doing. Okay. An entermim is I give you the main premise, the mother general set, uh, the general statement. Then I conclude, for example, and ask you to tell me what is the hidden one. Do magic. That's what I'm trying to do. So look at what I said. All women will go to heaven. Therefore, so I've left one step. I didn't give you the second one. That will help us create a syllogism, but you can do it. All women will go to heaven. Therefore, I conclude. Therefore, my father will go to heaven. What do you think I've, I've left out? My father is your father. I sit by your father, I get up. I hope you got it. All women will go to heaven. My father is a woman. That is what will make you conclude. Therefore, my father will go to heaven. 
what we just did was I gave you a premise, the main premise, and I gave you a conclusion. But because you know the valid pattern, you are able to tell what the hidden premise is and even tell me which valid pattern you use. That's the step ahead. Amazing. What I gave you is called an NTMM, E-N-T-H-Y, M-E-M-E, -E -E. N-D-M-M. What, what does it mean? We give you the main, sometimes we give you only one of the sub, the premises, not necessarily the main. But if I give you the conclusion, you will know what I did to it. So I gave you corn, and then on the table, you see Tom Brown. You will say, oh, the girl was there, the corn. Another person will receive corn from me on the table. You see, propose to go white. Like, oh, no bread. Say, ah, she went to do a, 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 a what, what, a more, eh? corn do with it. <laughs> it's the same starting point, but you're able to tell what was done to it. The corn has become brown. Telling you that she did that and that and that. So what? So you don't just know Modus Ponens lesson, but you also know how to move a step ahead and conclude even if I give you the premise. And because you know the correct pattern, which is what? Affirming the antecedent as named by what the second premise, you can now tell a deviation. You know, original dollar notes. If someone gives you a fake dollar, sometimes you don't even have to hold it. When he's counting, I say, oh, please, I don't have to this. If you operate a, uh, yeah, what's the name of the people who do that thing? Right? You, as soon as the person starts counting them, I say, oh, today, okay, we don't have any CD here. Yeah. Because you know that what he's holding in his counterfeit, just by seeing it. How much you know the original is what will help you detect the counterfeit. Don't go looking for how to know the counterfeit. Know the original. If you know the true spirit of God, eh, that's what you should work at. You don't need to be looking out for which one is you. As soon as the person starts speaking, the spirit in you can testify that we're in freedom. And maybe it looks so fine, but you will see that there's a restlessness in you. Your, your, your heartbeat should be what? How much light you have. Don't be interested in the darkness and what it is doing to you or not doing. You get light. Light and darkness don't argue. See that? When you switch on the light, darkness goes. So what? What is all this meant to, to tell you that? So if you know the original form, as soon as I start deviating from it, you can tell. Now see then. What is that fallacy that I've called the form, the formal fallacy? You know the correct one, so I want to teach you the wrong one for that tries to do modus ponens immediately so that you can get it. Then we can come to the next one. Ah, the crack, the crack. Okay. So on our screen now, watch. I'm showing you the correct modus ponens pattern, which is valid. And then the one that is trying to do modus ponens but doesn't do it well. Don't say modus ponens fallacy. You'll get your answer, the answer wrong. We don't have modus ponens fallacy. That fallacy has a name. Trying to do modus ponens, but that's it wrong. It has its own name. It's, it doesn't affirm the antecedent like modus ponens says we should do, which we have learned and we have enjoyed so far. It rather goes to affirm the consequence. That's what is happening on your screen. So look at the left. It says heavy smokers have lung issues on your screens now, please. And the next premise, the correct one says, Kofi is a heavy smoker. So we conclude, therefore, that he has lung issues. That's valid. That's modus ponens. See somebody trying to do modus ponens. To the right now, look. It doesn't affirm the antecedent there. What is happening? It says heavy smokers have lung issues. I told you that. If I say heavy smokers have lung issues, I've not said all those who have lung issues are heavy smokers. Because uh, anemic patients can also have lung issues. They don't smoke, but they're also inside the set of those who are, have lung issues. So if the person starts from there, it says heavy smokers have lung issues. Then the next premise says, Kofi has lung issues. Kofi is inside the mother set. So we should therefore conclude, look at the conclusion, that he is a heavy smoker. It's a lie, Umali. I'm not sure. That's a lie. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily follow. Kofi may not be in the set of heavy smokers and yet can be in the mother set of language. See that those who have language. That's why you shouldn't affirm the consequence. How do you know that? Look at what is happening there. Right, the right one. 
This one. A person says heavy smokers have lung issues. If you want to do modus ponens, what we say next is Kofi is a heavy smoker. Then you can validly conclude that he's a, he's a, he has what lung issues. That would have been correct. That would have been the left one here, modus ponens. This one says Kofi is a heavy smokers have lung issues. Next premise, Kofi has lung issues. So we should conclude that he's a heavy smoker. This one. No be valid or tomb. This one, a former fallacy, where we go um, affirming the conceit. You for no go affirm the conceal, you for affirm the anti. And the focus is where the second premise. I spoke to my Nigerian friends now. <laughs> Got it? So you know the original, you just, <laughs> you just knew what the counterfeit for modus ponens. I'll do the two lens and it's counterfeit and then we'll end. God willing, when we meet next week, we'll mop up from beginning now and then come and finish up nicely with hypothetical syllogism and disjunctive syllogism. You see that you become, this is the logic. This is the critical thinking proper. Ah, from the unit six, seven going, okay? The earlier ones are just foundations, which are very important to ground unit, but they are not the reasoning units. Okay, these units help you do the analysis, the deductions and the comparisons and what have you, proper solution. So we go to look at what? Modus tollens. What does modus tollens say? I think we should go to the original slide. Then when we get it, we'll come and compare the correct with the wrong. Now on my screen. I said they are all modus, but one is ponens or the other one is tollens. Both of them are valid, but the pattern of validity are not the same. Different homes, so different rules, yet it is working for both of them. You don't leave your home and go and copy somebody's home. The man opens the car for the woman in this house because they are car door <laughs> is suspect. If the, the man doesn't come and open, the door will be on the floor. <laughs> you you see it, your heart is breaking that they don't open the door for you. Your own is designer. So modus ponens, validity and co. And a modus tollens, validity and co. They are both valid. Now, what does modus tollens say? A few minutes. It tells you, look at its surname. In other words, how do we describe that pattern? It helps you know what to do. It is called negating the, con the consequence. You negate the consequence. And I already told you the name is gotten from what? The second premise, not the conclusion. It is what is happening in the second premise. The main premise gives you the preamble. Then you do something to it, and then it brings us the conclusion. See that? So what you are doing to it is what names the argument. Remember my corn example? So we have all been giving corn, but someone roasted her own, blended it, blah, 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 and created some brown. The other person perhaps just soaked it in water for some days. Before we know it, we have what? Uh, madam, some local drink from corn. Really? Yes. In fact, it didn't germinate a little. Wow. That is it there. The same corn. So what? So what you do to it is what names it. People get confused. That's why I've said it over and over again. It's not the conclusion that names uh, the whole argument. Okay, so what? So when I give you the universal statement or the conditional, if I give you the conditional, let's work. But if I give you the universal statement, you have already learned how to expand it, the feather the, the chicken before you take it to the place and cut it into shapes. We didn't give you post office, but you can still kill the chicken, remove the feathers, and then work with it. But I could have also brought you the dressed chicken direct, and you just spice it and you are off. Either way, we have learned that. Now, from the universal statement or the conditional, so let's work with the conditional first. If you study, then you will pass. What are we doing now? Modus tollens, Timothy. If you study, then you will pass. What should you do next? The rule says negate the consequence. We have learned negation, we know consequence. So if you study, then you will pass. What should you say next? You did not pass. That's our consequence. We negated. You did not pass. Therefore, you did not study. Do the same thing for the conclusion. If you love me, then you will obey my commandments. You did not obey my commandments. Therefore, you don't love me. If I come home early, 
then we will eat food. We did not eat food. It means I did not come home early. Now let's use some universals to do that. All oh, mangoes are fruits. This thing I'm holding is not even a fruit. Then it cannot be a mango. <laughs> you see that? That's, that's what you see on your screen now. If you have a passport, then you can travel. Let's do modus tollens with it and let's see. If you have a passport, then you can travel. Let's use hotel. <laughs> this is my bag. Are you okay? I'm very fine. We use hotel. Eh? If you have a passport, then you can travel. We want to use hotel, all of us go. Tollens. If you do. Hotel does not have a passport, therefore you cannot travel. Is that correct? No. No. It's very good. I'm no. happy someone no. they could not travel. Uh -huh. Then they could not travel. Could not travel then they could not travel. Oh, therefore, he doesn't have a passport. Therefore, he does well, have a passport. Now, let me So, that's all the rest oh. of you got to correct. The only wrong one was my friend, the gentleman who spoke first, which is fine. I wanted that to happen. So, see, my brother, the reason why yours was wrong was because you did the negations, fine, but you brought the antecedent rather first and concluded with the consequence, and that is not correct. So you said, I said, if you have a passport, then you can travel. The correct one should bring the, you can travel, which is our consequence, first, but negated. And then you conclude with antecedent, also negated, you see that? So if you have a passport, then you can travel. Otele cannot travel. Therefore, he does not have a passport. That would be valid. Some more. Let's do some more. Uh, whenever it rains, the ground gets wet. Modus stolen. Quickly, we are done. The ground is ground is wet. wet. Therefore, 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 we are all correct. The original says, if it rains, then the ground will be wet. That was the original. The next premise for Tolens must say, the ground is not wet. Therefore, we can conclude that it has not rained. That's correct. Now, I want to use universal negation so that your trouble will begin. <laughs> but the grace is sufficient. No man is perfect. I want a particular person to talk so that we can hear. I'm giving you no man is perfect. Let's use Kofi for an inform answer. Look, in exam, when we tell you, use this variable, use it. Otherwise, you get your marks wrong. You should be disciplined. Obey simple instructions. If I say use Kofi, then people are using Kwame for your egg. You are getting marks wrong, uh, questions wrong, because of disobedience. Why? So we are using Kofi. To do modus tollens. What is the given expression? No man is perfect. Remember, tollens has showed you what to do. Negate consequent first, then conclude by negating antecedent. Negation means if the original is positive, turn it upside down. If the original is negative, turn it upside down. I want one person to talk so that some people can hear clearly and then we can go. Kofi is no not man perfect. Is Everyone be patient. Therefore, no man is perfect. Please. Because it's a bit confusing. I want people to hear so one person speak now. Okay. No man is perfect. You are using coffee. So raise your hand. I see four hands up. I want more hands. Six now. No, no, no. It's not enough. Where's everyone? Raise your hand if you know it. I'm checking the classes for very good. That's better. So I will take Erica Odum now. Erica, help us. No man is perfect. You're creating modus. Tolens argument using Kofi. Kofi is not perfect, therefore he is a man. Is that correct? No. Uh, no. <laughs> thank you, Erica. You did, you did, but your friend says not correct, and I'm happy. I'm happy not because you didn't get it right. I'm happy that others can also see. So you, you look at it again. Expand your expression. When I say no man is perfect, open it out Let, so that I can clearly see your antecedent or your consequence. Do that. That is, defeather your chicken. If you don't do that, you'll get it wrong. Doreen and your name. Let's hear you then. Okay, no man is perfect. You're doing tolerance using cookie. Who is that? Hey, Doreen. 
They are muted. They're in. Yeah. No man is perfect. Mm -hmm. Kofi is not perfect. Good. Therefore, he is not a man. Well done. Well done. That's correct. Clap for her. <laughs> Go online, Claire. Give her some online clap. You know how to do that. <laughs> Go to the reaction. Some people are clapping for it. And we are falling down to clap. Or we don't know where to clap. <laughs> Very good, my lady. You did well. So no man is perfect. No See? man is perfect. That means if X is a man, then X is not perfect. You see that? Now you want to do modal no, 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 no. Your original consequence says X is not perfect. So if you want to negate X is not perfect, if you become X is perfect, then we put our copy there. So copy is perfect. Therefore, the conclusion must also be negated and it should be the antecedent. Therefore, copy is not a man. I'm sure that some will say, ah, what is the copy there? It's a man. We say, no, 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 no. We are not interested in the actuality of it. Validity is not interested in actual truth. Validity is just looking at the relationship between the premises and the conclusion, if the premises were true. So we are not interested in whether the thing is actually true or false. That's why I was saying, I can say all birds fly. Our lecture is a bird. It will mean that she flies. Validly following modus ponens pattern. Yet, because the premises are not true, we will say this is valid, but it is not sound and far smooth. Okay, so soundness, we learned that earlier. I told you I'll touch on it again. Soundness is a higher quality. After the argument is valid, you check and see if its premises are actually true. Then you call it a sound argument. See that? But we don't concern ourselves with the soundness of an argument when we are checking its validity, whether the conclusion follows from it or not. It's not about actual truth. And so if at this stage you want to practice, I want to you want to practice. Modus ponens, the valid pattern. Then you study the fallacy that affirms the consequent, which is trying to do modus ponens. That is there, eh? but doesn't do it well. You practice and practice and practice. Then you still practice modus tollens, which is what? Negating the consequent. It does so correctly. Then the fallacy that tries to do modus tollens, but does it wrongly. How? By rather negating the antecedent before concluding. That's what our friend did, the gentleman. Practice that also. Now for the two, use both universal affirmative statement and universal negative statement. That's how you polish up. So no matter how the devil comes, you are prepared. <laughs> he can come in white, you are there. If he comes in black, you are still steady because you are your sensibilities are sharp. That's what we are grooming you to have. When we meet God willing next week, then we can do hypothetical syllogism and disjunctive syllogism and more pap nicely. I'm so done. I think I enjoyed myself. When you go for tutorial, those should be your heartbeat. Don't go and expect that the team will do another lecture again. No, the team is there to polish up, take questions, highlight things for you, ask you, as you ask. So a team doesn't come with any shadow. It's not a lecture. The team comes to take your concerns as a student and help you understand. So if you don't have any concerns, he or she doesn't run a lecture because they don't examine you to come with a shed, see that. But you go to the and say, okay, Madam, please, I have a question. So the soundness, can you help me work this up, this one out? Example, this is, uh -huh. this, if I did this deduction this way, will it be valid? Because I'm a, a little confused about the notch and the, uh -huh. that's what tutorial is. Then you make the tea is very useful to you. Thank you very much. I'll pause our recording. I'll share this, I think. And then now, to those who are on the academic channel, do when I finish, I'll, move, I'll pull out all the others I did last week. Sometimes I even forget and put them on the academic channel, not to bore you. So if you are there, you can look at it and then add to what you do, okay? But on Sakai, I'll pull the ones that everyone can benefit from if they want to. Then we'll do fine. Let me stop the recording and take your questions. Thank you all very much. All right, so I see hands up. Uh, I 